The Big Story. You're the night clerk? You just signed the register. You just give me your money. Okay, you're the guy. Just tell me this. How's the hunting in these parts? You mean deer, bear, rabbit, that kind of thing? Yeah. Where can I get a 22 automatic pistol or rifle? Gee, I don't know. All right, tell me this. I see a big full-page ad in the paper. Open house at Calneva Ranch. What's that? It's a big place out near the California border, about 30 miles out. They do at the opening of every season. Free drinks on the house, free meal. Big crowd? Packed. Maybe that'll be even better than, what did you say, deers, bears, and rabbits? Yeah, that ought to be even better. Now I want a twenty-two rifle or automatic pistol. Now. Reno, Nevada. The story of a reporter who showed that gambling and divorce can also mean murder. Reno, Nevada. The stories that actually happened. Frank McCullough's story, as he lived it. The body was found slumped over the wheel of a Cadillac, a bullet having entered through the left temple and lodged in the brain. The necktie was drawn up tight against the throat. He was identified by a local resident of the Lake Tahoe region, just inside the Nevada border, near California. Why, sure, Sheriff, everybody knows him. Name's Wenzel. Owns a lot of property in these parts. Some say he's rich as Croesus. Some say he didn't have a dime. Two feet from the rich or poor real estate dealer, on the floor of the car was the casing from a 22 caliber shell. And on the seat next to him was a bag of sweet rolls bought at the Alexa Bakery near Lake Tahoe. These rolls bought here? That's right, Sheriff. These are our six for a quarter. They're very good. I'm sure, I'm sure. Did a big fat man, about 70, buy them? You mean Mr. Wenson? That's right. He buys them almost every other day. You know, sometimes I can't understand whether he buys them because he likes them, like he says, or... Because that's what he eats for his lunch. Did he say anything to you about going to the open house at the Calneva Ranch? Well, isn't that funny, now that you mention it? I said to my husband, what's he buying rolls for if he's going to the Calneva Ranch opening? He'll get enough to eat there. Okay, thanks. Say, let me have one of those brownies. They look good. By now, the news of the death that reached you, Frank McCullum, reporter for the Reno Gazette, reached all of Reno. And you were out at the Cal Never Ranch with Sheriff Parsons as he questioned the head waiter. The ranch was a beautiful, sprawling place. Its dining room in California, open till two. Its bar and gambling room in Nevada, open all night. Very pleasant and comfortable and very convenient. And the head waiter went with the place. Well, you see, Sheriff, our open house is perhaps the most popular event of the season... We get, oh, 2,500, 3,000 people in that day. And Wenzel was in? Oh, yes. Like I said, it was crowded. And Mr. Wenzel was waiting on the line for a table, and I didn't have a table. I mean, I couldn't give him a table alone, so I asked him if he would mind doubling up. He said, sure. And he sat down at the table with this other fellow. What was the other fellow like? Just a fellow, young. I really didn't notice. What did they talk about? I mean, at the table. Well, I wouldn't eavesdrop. Okay. Show me the waitress. Well, he was very fussy. I brought him the curry chicken, and he said, You call this curry chicken? And he sent it back. And then he said the mashed potatoes had lumps in them, the coffee was cold. This was and... Wenzel? Oh, no, so the other fella, the young fella. Good-looking one. You couldn't do nothing to please him. Even about the ice cream, he had to say something. Uh, what did they talk about? Well, as near as I could get, you know, I was very busy. The young one was interested in buying property in the area, and the fat one was... Uh, going... Wenzel? I guess that's his name. Well, he kept saying that there wasn't any better land in the Lake Tahoe region, you know, like a sales talk. And the young one kept saying, well, he didn't know if he wanted to stay in this part of the country, and the fat one kept saying how he couldn't do better. He kept saying these were the choicest lot in the whole area, but I was busy. I, I, I didn't really hear what they said. 
They leave together? Well, they must have. Because there they were, and when I looked the next time, there was a lady and a gentleman sitting there. I was surprised, because the young one left a dollar. He didn't act like a tipper to me. The fat one didn't leave nothing. The last link between the two men, the fat, dead one, and the thin, young one, came from an associate of Wenzel's, a young man who worked with him in the real estate office. Well, after he finished eating, I was at another table. He came over and he said, Eddie, that's my name, Eddie, I think I got a sale. And I said, gee, Mr. Wenzel, it's a funny time to be going out with a prospect. It was going on 11 o'clock. And then he said, listen, if I can't sell that boy a piece of property by moonlight, I'll eat my own necktie. And then to, to find the tie tied around his neck like it was, gee, he was a fine, happy, good man. And it stops there. A rich or poor man... Shot through the temple, last seen with a good-looking young prospect, period. And that's all. Nothing else shows up. But you, Frank McCullough, are a crime reporter. And for you, the case is not closed because of a theory you have. That is this. Somewhere, sometime... Someone always talks about every major crime committed. That's been your experience. Twelve years of it. And so, you start on your beer and listening system in the dives along Commercial Avenue, where somewhere, sometime, someone must talk. Have a beer, Tommy? Whiskey. You've got it? Tommy, this one happened 30 miles out. 31. From here to the Cal Never Ranch, 31 miles. I measured it once by car. How'd you know what I was talking about? He asked questions about a lot of places. What do you know about Wentz? I'm interested in finding out about... Maybe you shouldn't. Shouldn't what? You said you was interested. Maybe you shouldn't be. What does that mean? Just what I said. Look, do yourself a fat favor. Save yourself trouble. And I mean big trouble. Forget about it. Now, come on, where's the whiskey? Tommy knows. No crime within a hundred miles he doesn't know about. But there's no more. He swallows his whiskey and another one and a third. But there's still no more. Just the enigmatic, maybe you shouldn't be interested. Then Sergeant Dave Peters sidles over. Where are you going, reporter? Oh, just walking around. What gave you the idea you'd get any answers on the Wenzel killing here? How did you know I was on Wenzel? Look, let's don't spar, huh? I got other things to do. What do you know, McCullough? Oh, I've got ideas. I've got theories and I've got ideas. Okay, you play it close to the chest and so will I. Wait a minute. I know that Wenzel wasn't rich. I know he was a four-flusher. But he had those lots on consignment. And if he sold them, he had a dollar. And if he didn't, he had buttons. That much I know. I figure this prospect, the young guy, the good-looking one, he thought he had a take, but he found out he didn't have a take. Something got crossed up somewhere, and the gun went off. And, uh, what do you know about the prospect? Nothing. But I know this. Two days before the killing, there was a gunman in town. I don't know where he stayed. I don't know what he did. I don't know what he was after. That's something I heard about also. I know this guy, the gunman, was out shopping for a twenty-two. Now, that's the only connection. What he looks like, I don't know, and what he was after, I don't know, except he tried to get a twenty-two. You want to team up what I've got, what you've got, and vice versa? All right. You got a deal. But no stories in your paper. A gunman and a prospect buying real estate. A twenty-two caliber gun. And from the way Sergeant Peters talked, from the way Tommy talked, a case that isn't very healthy to mention. And so you don't. Not to your best friend. Not to your wife. But the next morning, Tommy, whose last name nobody knows, comes over to you in another Commercial Avenue bar. You got a loose half buck on you? Why, sure, all the time, Tommy. Whiskey, no chaser. So you and Sergeant Peters is a pair, hmm? You'll be getting in the gossip columns next. How do you know? Make that a beer, Chase. You, uh, you know the Golden Light Hotel? 
I've heard of it. There's a night clerk there by the name of Addison. But like I told you before, it's something you shouldn't be interested in. I'm not, Tommy. It's just that I'd like to get a room at the Golden Light. Where would I get a 22? I don't know nothing about a 22. You think if a fella comes in here and says, get me a 22, I'll go out and get him a 22? Look, Addison, I heard you weren't very particular. Okay, okay, I ain't denying it. This ain't the best hotel in town. You can get things here, sure. But guns? No, sir, that's out of my line. That's way out. Look, let's stop kidding around. You know just what I'm talking about. I'm talking about once. Look, you know what's the worst thing in the world to know? It's to know something about something you don't want to know. About a fella killing another fella. That's the most dangerous thing in the world to know. You ought to be glad I'm not talking to you. I've been walking around with this thing for three days now, and I'm going crazy with it. I don't want to know it. I don't want to talk about it. Let me alone. What'd he look like? What did the gunman look like? I'm telling you, three days I'm going crazy with it. I'm not going to say another word. Don't you think I want to live too? The information alone could frighten someone. But paralyze a man as the clerk is paralyzed. Only one thing could do that. The presence of the killer in town. And then, in a hotel bar... He says, you McCullough? Go ahead. He says, stop talking to Pete as the cop. He says, stay away from Tommy, the stool. Who says? He says, leave Addison alone. Stay out of the golden light. Look, stop getting mysterious. He says, forget about it. Because he says... He says he's watching you every single step of the way. And he says maybe you're a smart enough reporter to want to go home to your wife and the two kids you got. One's six and one's two, ain't they? That's what he said. You're on a case of murder. But you haven't spoken about it to anyone. Not even your wife. You, Frank McCullough, reporter for the Reno, Nevada Gazette, and Sergeant Dave Peters are working together on the case. And though you keep it to yourselves, someone knows every move you make. Someone's watching you. Maybe the killer. And you just left a girl, a girl you never saw before, who told you... He says, forget about it. Forget all about it. That's what he says. And so, of course, you go to your partner, Dave Peters. You're slipping, Frank. Why? Because obviously she knows more than she told you. And because there are ways of getting to learn what that more is and you didn't do it. So? So I think I can. I'll go back to the hotel bar and we'll find out what it is. Okay, partner? Okay. I can't tell you. I can't. I swear I can't. He'll kill me if I tell you. Did you ever hear of the police department, lady? Guys don't go around killing people just like that. Now, who is he and where is he in talk? Now, you want me to go through the whole routine and arrest you for suppressing information, hindering the prosecution of justice and so on and so forth? Now, where is he? He's up in room 204. Asleep. Ludigan is his name. But please, maybe I'm stupid, but don't say it was me, huh? All right, Ludigan, come out of it. Come out of it. Look at his eyes, hmm? Peters. He looks coked up. Maybe. Come on, Ludigan. Come on, come on. Let's sit up. Whoa, whoa, whoa what are you doing? Take your hands off me. Leave me alone, huh? All right, Ludigan. Where'd you get the gun? Uh, what did you call me? Ludigan? Is that who I am? Oh, no. No, it, it, it don't sound right. It, it don't sound right. What are you doing? Putting on an act here? Come on, stand up. Stand up straight. Come on, stand up. I just walked around. Well, all of a sudden, I said, you know, I don't know who I am. All of a sudden, like that. And then I... I heard a violin playing some music somewhere. A violin. And it started to tingle all down my arms and in my legs. 
began to tingle, and I said, it must be I got something to do with a violin. That's who I am. Something to do with a violin. What are you giving So I went to the store, this music store, and I says, give me a violin and a bow. And I put it up my shoulder under my neck, and I started to play. And I says, please, God, let me know how to play the violin. Maybe then I'll find out who I am. But I couldn't play. It came out sour. I couldn't play a thing, not a note. It only made scratching sounds. I never found out until you just now said Ludigan. And I don't think that's right. I don't think that's who I am. You registered in the hotel. You signed the register. The only time I felt anything that was right when I heard that music. And now that don't mean nothing even. Nothing. Nothing at all. What do you think, Chris? <laughs> all right, Ludigan, sit down and go back to sleep. Don't go anywhere. Come on, Frank. I think he's on the level. Uh, me too. But if he is on the level, then... Then our girlfriend is giving us a beautiful line. Oh, sure, that's what it is. She threw us Ludigan, figuring that we'd take him in. A dopey amnesia can't prove where he was, where he wasn't. Figured we'd be satisfied with him. That means That's that... right. And I'll tell you another little surprise. I talked to your friend Tommy just to make sure. You know who she is? Who? She's the wife of the night clerk at the Golden Light. Well, well, well. Only we're not going there right now. We're going to wait until it's nice and dark and late and he's sleeping. Then we'll pay him that call. The night clerk. He's off duty tonight. Put the light on, Frank. Hey, what are you doing? What's the idea? Hey. Oh. Yeah. Oh. That was a nice idea, Addison. Throw us a fall guy. Throw us a guy who don't know who he is, and maybe we'll pick him up, and maybe that'll end the case. Look, I tell you, you got to believe me. We'll believe you when you start talking about the tall, thin, handsome guy. The guy with 22. There's nobody around. We've checked. There's nobody around but two of my men. So if you want to talk quiet, that's okay, too. But talk. You think I'm kidding, huh? About it being dangerous to know. I'm telling you, never in my life I never meet a guy like him, and I met a lot. Ice cold. Everything he said, everything he did. Plan. Careful. Icy. You look in his eyes, you have to turn your face away. All right, fine. Now, let's get down to the facts. The first thing he done was... You know about the ad in your paper that Cal Never Ranch takes for the open house? Go on. No more stalling. I'm not. I swear, I'm telling you. Well, he asked me about it. He turned to the page and showed me the ad and says... That was two days before the killing. I think the hunting there might be better than deers, bears, and rabbits. Now get me a twenty-two. I never got nobody a gun before, never. But you know just to look at this guy that if you didn't do what he said... Never mind, go on. <sighs> so I got it for him, through a guy I know, and then I didn't see him for 24 hours, and then he came back. He came back going on one in the morning. I was all alone. How much money you got, Addison? Gee, I ain't got any money. What do you mean? I'll tell you a funny story about that gun you got me. I went out to the place, the ranch, and I met this big, fat, dope Wenzel. He tells me how rich he is, all the land he owns. Five acres there, 20 acres there. So I says, this is what I'm waiting for. He's got a fat Cadillac. He takes me out there in the moonlight to see the prize lots, and I says, all right, Pop, what do you got in your pocket? And the dumb, fat slob, he started to scream... So what can I do? <laughs> he had eight bucks in his pocket and a bag of sweet rolls. Ain't that a laugh? You, you shot him? How much money you got? I got a 1949 Mercury downstairs. I'll leave it with you for security because there'll probably be roadblocks anyhow. Now, how much money you got? The car is yours. And that's the truth, Sergeant. I got it for $200 and he gave me the car. I, I never drove it. I never touched it. Where is it? It's out in the back in the garage. License plates? There ain't none. He made me bury him. He said, don't look at the numbers. If you ever seen a man's face cold, icy... All like... right. Let's go where you buried the plates. You dig them up. Texas license plates. And now it's a matter of waiting. 
You check the plates with the Texas authorities and find his name, Martin Stevens. A record a page and a half long. Wanted for robbery, for assault, escape from prison. This man is dangerous. Everything in the book. And you wait. And then a disturbing report comes in from Houston, Texas. Martin Stevens picked up Houston, Texas today. Claims to have been in this city past five weeks. Corroboration by wife, local school teacher, completely reliable. Do you want extradition? Peters, I don't get it. I don't get it at all. Let me see that. Unless... Dave, unless... Yeah. Those icy eyes. The kind of thing he made Addison do. Shouldn't be hard for a guy like that to have his own wife lie the same way. I'm putting in for extradition right now. He comes. Martin Stevens. Well-dressed, thin, tall, good-looking. A tolerant smile playing on his face. I was never in Nevada. I never heard of this ranch, whatever you call it. I never stayed at the hotel on Commercial Avenue, and I don't know how to use a gun. Otherwise, I'm at your service. The eyes are, as Addison said, absolute ice. Now warm for purposes of charming people, convincing them. So, because your experience as a reporter has helped so much, you are present when Sergeant Peters lines them up, the inexorable array of people, one after the other. As I said before, he waited on the line because I didn't have any free tables. And then I showed Mr. Wenzel to a table. This gentleman was sitting there. I can't make a mistake. No, sir. Him being so good-looking and with that cute mustache and the way he left me a tip, it was a whole dollar bill. Mr. Wenzel said to me, pointing to him, if I can't sell him by moonlight, I'll eat my own necktie. It was his idea to tell the cop and the reporter that this Ludigan, the fellow who lost his mind, that he was the one who'd done it. Okay, Addison, take a good look. I don't know. Those are bars between you. One-inch steel bars, and he's been frisked. And his eyes can't do any more than look at you. Well? He's the one. I got him the gun, and I gave him the $200, and he made me bury the plates. Okay, Addison. Go on home and forget all about it. Even with all that, you still won't prove it. You won't prove a thing. I spent the whole time in Texas. Houston, Texas. I wouldn't be so sure, Stevens. I think we'll prove it fine. And you do. The jury listens to the witnesses, the waitress, the head waiter, the business associate, the night clerk and his wife. And then they listen to the handsome man with a mustache and icy eyes. And they make a judgment. And the judgment is as you stated. And once more, your theory is right. Somewhere, sometime, someone always talks. Now we read you that telegram from Frank McCullough of the Reno, Nevada Gazette. On trial for first-degree murder, killer in tonight's big story accused the night clerk of being the murderer. But the state clinched their case by producing the murder gun which killer had pawned in Los Angeles. Killer was sentenced to life in prison. And so ends another big story. In order to protect the names of people actually involved in tonight's authentic big story, the names of all characters in the dramatization were changed with the exception of the newspaper reporter. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio Service, the voice of information and education. <laughs> <laughs> 